Lakeside is pleased to sponsor this exciting broadcast featuring Dr. Sandra Bloom and Sarah Yonassi on Voice America. Welcome to Creating Presence with your hosts, Dr. Sandra Bloom and Sarah Yanisi. Over the next hour, you'll learn about the processes that steer our hearts and minds and how to improve our collective social health. Welcome, everybody, to Creating Presence. I'm Dr. Sandra Bloom, and I'm here with my co host, Sarah Yanisi. Hi, everyone. Sarah and I have developed uh, an organizational intervention to help organizations really integrate trauma-informed practice. And we use an acronym for PRESENCE, for all the letters of the word PRESENCE. In this podcast, <clears throat> what that's what we're doing, is looking at each letter of the acronym and then talking with experts and leaders in a v wide variety of areas to help us kind of think outside of the box and work to improve our collective social health. So the first P in the acronym stands for partnership and power. And we're going to take a deeper dive into this topic with a, a real focus on social health in workplace environments. So partnership and power are critical contributors to the experiences of trauma. Um, but they also provide a lifeline for recovery and repair. Last week, we looked at political abuses of power um, with Jared Yates Sexton, and we talked a lot about the antidotes uh, to those abuses of power being democracy and shared decision making. And we want to continue that discussion this week, um, but we want to look at it a little closer to home by thinking about how experiences of helplessness in toxic workplaces um, show up and how they affect us. And um, we'll also be looking at some of those antidotes and interventions. I mean, re really, most of us spend more time in our workplaces than we do, you know, playing or having fun or being with our families. So these environments that we work in have a lot of power in our lives. Sometimes one hopes as places that give us a sense of purpose and meaning, but sometimes a place where we experience demoralization, adversity, and trauma. Our listeners might be familiar with the terms quiet quitting, uh, which really is about mentally checking out. Um, or loud quitting, which is basically broadcasting your displeasure with your job on social media. And one way to understand both of those phenomena is to understand the psychology and biology that drives both the experiences of toxic workplaces and the behavior that follows from the people in the workforce. Sandy and I are really drawing on what we've learned and what we've come to know about how trauma, adversity, and chronic stress affect our brains, how they affect group dynamics and behaviors, as well as how they contribute to organizational trauma. So let me detail that a little bit about what happens in a workplace that's become toxic. One way to think about it is drawing on your knowledge of what you know about the fight flight response, because everybody's experienced that. And then move it up and think about it. What happens when a whole organization becomes, it's called hyper arousal. What, what does that look like? And it looks like chronic crisis, right? And that's for a lot of healthcare, mental health care, social service, organizations today, that's what they're in. They've lost a lot of people out of the workplace. There's all kinds of things that have happened that have gone wrong. And what chronic crisis does is that people stop feeling safe together. And that you don't actually have to do anything for somebody not to feel safe. It's just in the environment of crisis that nobody feels safe when we're in a crisis state. And when it's chronic, it really erodes our ability to trust each other. And without trust, we really can't be very effective at all. 
But what happens, what you'll see as a result of that is a lot of emotional dysregulation where people just are saying and doing things that are really hurtful and sometimes cruel uh, because they can't, they can, they're not able to manage their emotions appropriately. And that leads to a lot of bad communication, a lot of things that become undiscussable, so the stuff that goes underground and isn't dealt with, isn't talked about, no conflicts get resolved. And one of the signs of that is that the grapevine, every organization has a grapevine that's, you know, really active usually, uh, at, but it, it's normal. It's normal in human groups, but under conditions of chronic crisis, the grapevine gets poisoned and you get all kinds of, oh, ideas that are really toxic, um, misinformation, lies, exaggerations, all kinds of things go wrong. And when this is all happening, there's a problem often between people among having healthy boundaries. Boundaries become impermeable or they get too rigid and people aren't talking to each other. So information and knowledge gets siloed. And when this is all going on, we lose, we lose memory, we forget. We forget to draw on things that we know. Um, and instead, we keep repeating things that don't work. And as this is all going on, fewer and fewer people are willing to step up to the plate and participate. They just drop out and just kind of shrug their shoulders and go, oh, well, it's just the way it is. Nothing I can do. And that refers to what Sarah was just talking about, about helplessness that we develop in organizations, a kind of a sense of widespread learned helplessness. There's nothing we can really do to make this any better. And what you've ended up with is a hostile workplace, a place where nobody wants to work and it's toxic for everybody. Yeah, Sandy, you and I are kind of science nerds. Um, and so one of the ways that we have tried to really understand why this happens um, is to look at the science. And so biology, um, human biology, tells us a lot. Um, and in studying the impact of stress and trauma on human beings, we really understand there are two parts of the brain that um, dictate a lot of that reaction and, and sort of set the course for how these uh, toxic work environments can develop. And those are the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, um, the front of the brain and the back of the brain. Um, the front of our brain is where we do all of our best reasoning and kind of access logic and logical thinking. The amygdala is where we get the fight or flight or freeze reaction. And so when we are under a lot of stress, um, and, and it's interesting because we often think of the fight or flight reaction getting triggered by danger, but conflict with coworkers, um, interpersonal problems are have the same effect. They really are that same kind of danger signal for us. And when that happens, it activates the amygdala, the back part of our brain. And so I like to think actually that the quiet quitting is really a form of that freeze response or that flight response, like kind of withdrawing or kind of getting paralyzed or stuck. And that loud quitting is really more aligned with the fight response, kind of pushing back, public publicly shaming employers. Um, there are also psychology components that affect this phenomenon or sort of contribute to it. And when stress triggers that amygdala response, it really takes that prefrontal cortex, that front part of our brain offline. And so we lose our capacity for thinking clearly and, and making good decisions. We're much more reactive. The other psychology piece is about resistance to change. Um, we like things to be predictable. And even if they're terrible, 
we will hold on to them because they're familiar. And so we find that even when we try or when good leaders try to make improvements, to try to make things better, we sort of go back to that baseline. Um, even if it's toxic, it's familiar. There are also sociological reasons uh, that we see this. And we are, you know, at this point in human uh, social structures, really global. We are a um, very connected world, but our brains don't operate like we are. Our brains kind of operate like we're still in very small communities. And so we tend to have in-groups and out-groups. We have cliques or silos, kind of the word we use in workforce uh, terminology. And so that's contributing as well. And then we also have um, issues around morality. Our technology has developed so much more quickly um, than our legal system or our justice system or our social constructions of morality can keep up. And so um, we're still at sort of this early stage of, of figuring out how to define right and wrong in this global situation. And so we're sort of relying on much more basic or primitive um, moral structures. The result of all that is that we are really experiencing a workplace crisis. In the last five years, the average hospital, this statistic blew my mind when I saw it, the turnover was 100.5% of its workforce. So, so it's hard to imagine when you're not working in a hospital what that must be like. Mental health facilities turnover rates of over 30%. It means you can never really catch up. You can never really build systems of trust and, and competence because people keep changing. They keep moving. Um, and it means role definitions become really confused. What am I supposed to be doing today? It's because it's different than what I was supposed to do yesterday. Um, and it affects management training. So when managers turn over that rapidly, then nobody necessarily knows what's going on. And of course, we're beset everywhere with a lack of cultural and racial diversity. And everybody's under you know, strict regulations about what they're supposed to do and how they're going to be punished if they don't do things properly when it's really hard to do things properly. So we have a lot of ethical dile dilemmas in our organizations and a lot of um, moral distress that's that's happening. We, Sandy, you and I, um, developed creating presence as a way to mitigate all of these impacts. Um, so what we've tried to do and in our work with organizations um, in order to shift their, you know, operating from this kind of toxic, biologically, psychologically, sociologically, and morally based crisis to um, a better place is um, to focus on leadership. So really looking at how power is distributed. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about that with our guests today. Um, but also focusing on emotion regulation, right? the expectation that every individual is responsible for man managing their own emotions. Like we do a lot of talking about normalizing emotions, right? We, this, this idea that we like, we can leave our emotions at the door. Or we can, you know, we right. can leave our own personal stuff at home and come to work and, and be robots is bananas. Um, we show up with our emotions. They're part of us. They live inside of us, but we also, have to know what to do in order to um, disrupt the reactions or behaviors that come from straight emotions. We also think a lot about managing complexity. Um, that's a really important part of our creating presence work. And 
we find that these hierarchical, top-down authoritarian systems uh, just don't work for managing the kind of complex environments that we're in. Um, and so we have to do something different. It reminds me of a conversation we had uh, with an organization that had a uh, a young person and uh, who who tragically died. And the you know the response was this authoritarian uh, decision to just stop doing things a particular way. But that really engendered total helplessness in the staff members. And so, they needed to figure out how to do that differently, how how to um, create an opportunity to empower the staff rather than just telling them what to do. So we will be back shortly. Um, we want to thank you for listening to Creating Presence. Coming up after the break, we'll be talking to Dr. Jennifer Fried, who will share her research and work on institutional trauma. If you would like your organization to be aligned in its values, practices, and skills to be trauma-informed, trauma-responsive, and trauma-resilient, Creating Presence is the program you are looking for. The Creating Presence model is an online and coach certification program authored by internationally renowned Dr. Sandra Bloom. This program is designed to help your organization become certified as a safe and value-aligned place for both your staff and clients. Creating Presence is managed by Lakeside, the host of this broadcast. For more information as to how your organization can create presence, go to creatingpresence.net. Lakeside, your resource for trauma-responsive care. Welcome back to Creating Presence. Sandy, Sarah, and their guests will discuss strategies and innovative practices for restoring our collective social health. Welcome back to Creating Presence. I'm Dr. Sandra Bloom, and I'm here with my co-host, Sarah Yannese. Uh, we want to welcome our guest, Jennifer Fried. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Fried is a psychology researcher, educator, and author. Her research on betrayal trauma and institutional betrayal and institutional courage have really revolutionized the field of trauma. So we are very happy to have you here, Jennifer. Thank you. So your work focuses on betrayal trauma and institutional betrayal. So can you tell us what those terms mean, the way you've defined them and what they represent? And also tell us what DARVO means. Okay, um, betrayal trauma is a term that I first introduced in the very early 1990s, so quite a long time ago. And it was intended to capture the particular dilemma and, and the basically fundamental conflict for a person who's being abused or otherwise mistreated by somebody they trust, depend upon, or care for. And this is a fundamental dilemma because we, um, as humans, a very social species, have the need both to attach to our caregivers, to people taking care of us, um, so we do that from infancy on. And in attachment, the, the way we experience that is typically very strong, positive regard, often love. And what we do behaviorally is we connect with people, we approach them, we engage with them. But we also have a need to detect betrayal and cheating because also because of our socialness. When people betray or cheat us, they take resources from us, they hurt us. And if we detect it, we can take protective actions, we can confront the person, we can withdraw from them. But those behaviors are at odds with the attachment system. And when our survival depends on the abusive caregiver or person in power, we really need to stay attached often. We don't have the choice. And so a way to get through that terrible bind is to suppress awareness of that betrayal. But there's a cost in suppressing awareness of betrayal. It's what I call betrayal blindness, because it's hard to get free. It's hard to take protective action from the cheating and betrayal. 
And this idea um, was one, as I said, from years ago, but we tested it in a great deal of research as of other researchers and have found that indeed betrayal is particularly toxic. And it's also associated with unknowing um, betrayal blindness. Starting um, in around 2005, somewhere in there, um, I started to get very interested in the possibility that the betrayer might not just be another person. It might not just be a parent or an, a boss, but it could be an institution. And humans attach to institutions too. It makes us vulnerable to the pain of betrayal. And we behave towards institutions as we behave towards people who take care of us. We, we engage, we approach, we're available. And sometimes we, our whole life is dependent on the institution, or at least our, our, you know, our, our strong ambitions and what we want out of life. Well, what the, when the institution betrays, this would be kind of institutional betrayal, and that's what the term is meant to capture. But um, at first, we didn't know what the impact of institutional betrayal would be on people. And so we started to research that as well. And found, first of all, that there's just a lot of institutional betrayal that goes on. And we devised a way to measure it. And we found that, you know, and in all this research, we don't ask people, did an institution betray you? We describe behaviors that are betraying behaviors. And we found that institutions regularly betray people. But even more importantly, we found there is a big cost psychologically and physically to people for that betrayal. And of course, some betrayal has a cost materially. If you know, if your employer pays you less because you are the wrong race or gender or age, that affects you materially. But betrayal, institutional betrayal, also affects you psychologically, which can manifest in physical problems as well as <clears throat> mental health and behavioral problems. And that's because we are vulnerable to betrayal from those we care for. So for instance, if you see something going on with an institution that's very important to you, your church or your school or your government, and they're hurting some other group of people, it can still leave a, a psychological wound for you, even though it doesn't affect you materially. And we know this from now quite a bit of research. A review article just was published last week, actually, looking at the, um, I think they found 38 peer-reviewed studies, in, and we know there are many more in addition, but they found 38 peer-reviewed studies looking at institutional betrayal and found over and over again, these studies documented harm. Um, I think sometimes this is due to bad actors, but more often it's due to people not realizing that the way their systems are set up is harmful. And that means the great news is that means we can improve systems. And you were saying earlier, trust matters so much. If institutional betrayal leads people not to trust institutions, that's dangerous for our whole society. But we all know it doesn't work for institutions to just say, trust us. They have to earn the trust by being trustworthy. And that's where institutional courage comes in. It's a set of um, behaviors institutions can engage in to stop betraying. And it takes courage because it's changing, you know, and you also said, Sarah, people, people don't like to change and they don't. Um, it disrupts power structures for one thing, but it is doable. And then Sandy, you asked about DARVO. DARVO is an acronym that I also um, introduced in the 90s, but have researched more recently. That It stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And it's a tactic that people who are being held accountable can engage in. So they can deny they did the thing they're being held accountable for. They can attack usually the credibility of the person who's raised the issue. And then most insidiously, they can take the victim role and cast the person who's brought it to light as the offender. They, you know, shoot the messenger kind of response. And We've researched DARVO more recently and found that it is another, unfortunately, common reaction. It tends to be to work in the perpetrator's um, benefit. So it helps um, the perpetrator appear more credible to, to observers. It also tends to induce self-blame in the part of the person receiving that DARVO and self-blame is associated with self silencing so it works in keeping people quiet um again though i do think there's a happy um a happy message too which is we also have research indicating that if we teach people about darvo it becomes less effective 
And then finally, when institutions do it, and they can do it, they can DARVO too, then it's institutional DARVO, a kind of institutional betrayal. DARVO even made it onto South Park. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I use that, that was, cartoon in my classes. Oh, I'm so glad. It was one of the weirder moments in my life as a professor to wake up in the morning because I don't really watch TV very much and I didn't really exactly know what South Park was. I knew it was something famous, but you know, just I live under a rock, right? And I woke up in the morning and my email was full of messages. Darbo was on South Park. <laughs> it's like, this is weird. <laughs> Sandy and I are, are doing a lot of our focused work with organizations um, and staff <clears throat> workers in human services. What are the long-term outcomes or effects of working in these institutions um, where betrayal trauma and institutional betrayal are normative? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. And when we first did the research, we started with students in educational institutions. But since then, we uh, we and other researchers have looked at employees in, in, in educational institutions and employees and patients in the medical system. Um, and as I'm sure you would expect that when there's institutional betrayal, it's bad for the employees. They tend to um, suffer more mental health and physical symptoms. But it's also bad for the institutions because people disengage. They um, don't come to work. They quit their job. Um, and so ultimately, it's not really helping the institution. Um, it might be beneficial to a certain person in power in the short run to engage in institutional betrayal, but it doesn't help the institution. Um, in, uh, it, interestingly, there's some studies also looking at institutional betrayal in in healthcare, finding it's also really bad for patients. And it, it's not um, it's not looking at institutional betrayal as to say medical error. It's looking at institutional betrayal as how an organization responds, say, after there's been medical error or after there's been a sexual violation. It's how the institution manages, handles, or fails to manage and handle a problem that has occurred in, in that context. Um, there's a, there's increasing um, diversity in the kind of populations people have been looking at. So in police, um, law enforcement, in um, other in religion, other groups that um, involve some some amount of um, human services, and it, this, the pattern has shown up in, in all these different realms. So what does practicing institutional courage look like yeah. and you know what action does it require from leaders and from staff members in human services particularly yeah, yeah. so we have identified um, specific steps institutions can take and of course some, to some extent you know each institution will be a little different and exactly what steps are most needed will vary but two, two steps that just often make such a difference um, that are not that hard to institute. One is to engage um, in using scientifically sound anonymous surveys for the, um, the stakeholders. That might be the staff, it might be you know, the, the clients of an organization. And finding out what's really going on, because so much of what really causes harm, it people don't feel is safe to say um, whether you know it's because they've been sexually harassed, or they feel they're not being paid, they're being discriminated against, or whatever you know it is. It it may be very dangerous and risky to say something for they may get darboed among other things, right. but if you give them an anonymous, scientifically sound survey you can get a lot of information about what's really going on for people. And that can be so radicalizing for the whole system because it's so easy to deny the problem. You know, when people do studies, like say of presidents of universities and you ask them, does your camp, does, is there a problem with college sexual assault out there in the world? They're like, yes. And then you ask them, is there a problem on your campus? No. 
And this tendency to not believe it's in your own backyard is very powerful, but an anonymous scientific assent survey can just break through that. That's one thing. And it, you know, it's not free. To do it right, you're going to have to hire some, some you know, people who know what they're doing, but it is not that expensive. The other, um, another step that I think you know, is so powerful is instituting a way to cherish whistleblowers. You know that whistleblowers tend to get extremely darvoed. They tend to be often, you know, have their lose their job or, you know, just be so harmed. And yet most whistleblowers are the most loyal, caring, conscientious members of a community. They bring it, bring this difficult truth up because they want to help fix the system. And it is not at all hard to institute a process of cherishing whistleblowers so that that reflexive desire to shoot the messenger is um, is a bit thwarted. You know, if you just tell people don't retaliate, that's hard to, to implement. Um, but if you give people an alternative, uh, a way to do something respectful, and when I say cherish the whistleblower, I don't mean um, anything too complicated. It can be as simple as um, issuing a statement of thanks and and validating the whistleblower's desire to help the organization. Um, and having that in place uh, in advance just can you know, really help an organization not fall into the bad habit of punishing people who bring things up and silencing that information. I think that what we see in some of the organizations we work with is when information comes to light, um, when people do practice institutional courage, the information then is seen and acknowledged, but people don't always know what to do to repair it. Yeah. Um, do you see that too? What what do you what do you suggest for next steps once there is some acknowledgement and recognition? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not acknowledgement is a necessary but not sufficient step. And it needs to be followed by action of some kind. Um, one of the ways that going back to the idea of a whistleblower, um, one of the ways you can cherish a whistleblower is um, actually following whatever um, you know information they've brought to light um, and it, empowering them to be part of a team to address the problem because often they do have ideas and insights on how to fix. Um, so it, it sort of throws potentially some resources behind this person very motivated to fix the problem. Um, and that can be very powerful. And another you know, thing that can really make a difference is forming a committee or hiring a person to actually do a review of the internal policies and practices finding out which ones, and especially if you've got that anonymous survey data, find out which ones are having these negative effects. One, one thing often that's working counter to the desire to have a healthy organization is the whole reporting structure for people when there's you know something that's gone wrong. And developing a better reporting mechanism for people can really make a difference. So, um, there's, you know, it gets pretty specific, you know, for the organization, depending on what's going wrong, but um, making a commitment to follow up with the data and information and making changes and then having to report it back to the community is a step in the right direction. I do, um, I do know for though, it's not enough just to fix the problem once and be done with it. This is a, this is a process that has to be done repeatedly. So, you know, if you have a committee to look at the institutional behavior, that committee should kind of, you know, in some way be permanent. Um, it, it needs to keep happening over and over again. It's a, it's like, you know, exercise or good nutrition or anything that you just need to keep doing. You're talking <laughs> about really changing culture. And I think connecting the dots for me around this concept of of partnership and shared power 
because when we leave, when we give information to leaders and, and they say, okay, we need to do something and then take it upon themselves, sort of like the example I was giving right before the break, which is to just say, okay, stop doing this, <laughs> but we don't tell people what to do instead or yeah. include them in figuring out what that might be, then we really, you know, end up in a, in a pickle. Yeah. And, you know, another like thing that goes along with that is when we focus on punishing people for doing something wrong, it is less effective than when we focus on rewarding people for doing something right. And we've known that from so much behavioral science. It just, the carrot works better than the stick. And yeah, give people ideas about how to do it right and then reward them for doing it right. Thanks so much. We want to thank you for listening to Creating Presence. We just heard from Dr. Jennifer Fried, who shared her experience and expertise um, focusing on institutional courage. Coming up after the break, we'll talk to Carol Austin and Jennifer Laristis about their use of trauma-responsive practice in their organizations. We'll be right back after this message. If you wish to go into production to provide your own trauma training, Lakeside Productions can provide you studio rental, design, filming, editing, learning management support, and consultation for video streaming for your organization or systems of care. Lakeside Productions has developed over 50 courses and videos that are all trauma-based and customized with a variety of applications. If you would like to have more information regarding Lakeside Productions, go to our website at Lakeside Training. Org. Lakeside, your resource for trauma responsive care. Welcome back to Creating Presence. Sandy, Sarah, and their guests will discuss strategies and innovative practices for restoring our collective social health. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Creating Presence. I'm Dr. Sandra Bloom, and I'm here with my co host, Sari Annecy. Hi. We'll be continuing our conversation with our two guests, who are two people who've led the process of implementing a trauma-informed care in their organizations by adopting Creating Presence. So thanks to both of you, Carol and Jennifer, for, for coming on the show. Um, I want to introduce Carol Austin. She is the executive director of First Up which is a nonprofit organization which works to make sure that children and families have access to high quality early childhood care and education, critically important as we know now. To this end, First Up serves nearly 6,000 early childhood education practitioners every year. Uh, and their work reaches about probably over 50,000 children in Southeastern Pennsylvania. First Up has also graduated 97 new advocates of its ECE, that's Early Childhood Education Fellowship, since the program began in 1997. And First Up provides quality improvement supports in more than 200 early childhood education programs every year. We are also joined by Jennifer Laristis, and she is the Manager of Professional and Program Development at Wellspan Philhaven. Over the last three years, she has led the staggered implementation of Creating Presence across three different cohorts of programs, totaling approximately 900 of Wellspan Philhaven staff. She oversees training, supports skill adoption, and has worked with the board of directors and executive leadership to align their policy and practice with trauma-informed values. And she's done this across programs offering a whole range of services from wellness and employer services, solutions to advanced care for complex medical and behavioral conditions in South Central Pennsylvania and Northern Maryland. Um, I am so excited to see both of you, to have you here together. I've worked very closely um, with both of you and uh, can't wait for everyone else to hear about your work. Uh, so well, great to see you. Great, great to see you. To see you. Um, so what did you learn about the use of power and the practice of partnership in your organization during your implementation? Well, it is very hard work. I will say that, um, as you mentioned, you know, this has been a coursework over 
a number of years and it it is not for the faint of heart. So, uh, and we've worked together quite a bit to hone the materials. And I just want to say, we really appreciate all the work that you and Sandy have put into this um, since it is a very heavy lift. I do feel fortunate that I'm part of Wellspan, which Wellspan Health is a, quite a large organization in South Central Pennsylvania and Northern Maryland. And we already have a strong mission and values, right? And even before our work with Presence, we were engaged in what's called Lean Daily Management System. And it already has a lot of principles and tenets of uh, good work and what you need to do in an organization. So that helped us quite a bit. You know, the, the foundations and pieces were already there. Um, but what we learned is that, again, it was a lot of hard work and that we needed to engage all levels, right? Not just from the programs that we were working with and the little teams that we created, right? We really needed to engage in, in a much bigger way, uh, the senior leadership. So we had our, you know, our kickoffs and awarenesses and leaders were aware that we were doing this, um, but we found that we really had to drive it further. Uh, it wasn't enough for just the leaders to kind of, oh, they're doing that thing over there and that program over there, right? It, they really had to know it um, and be part of helping. Um, and that means supporting the staff schedules. I mean, we learned that um, we were doing this through the height of COVID mm -hmm. and all the things that came with that. And I mean, Sarah, you were part of our coaching meetings in our first cohort. And I'm sure you heard all the time, the word of the day was overwhelmed. Things mm -hmm. possible, right? How many times did everyone was just that's all they could feel or nothing. I mean, they were just like, um, so that that's, we learned that you, you have to have support up and down um, all levels. And to make to it work. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Carol? So we are a much smaller organization in terms of staff or our staff is uh, 40. Uh, so we're not a huge organization like Wealth Plan. And we started our implementation um, 16 months ago. Um, so we haven't been engaged for years. We, we're at the beginning of this. And I think, you know, yes to everything Jennifer is saying. And I would say that, you know, we have learned that there are so many pro the processes we want to have in place. So I appreciated even some of what Dr. Jennifer shared, uh, both about continuing to revisit and revisit, but you know, putting those processes in place, like new policies, new processes, um, you know, we, we're starting to discover like what's missing. Um, we, we're discovering you know, more about shared leadership uh, within our organization. You know, it's really helped having an enactment team, a team of folk that are really looking at how we are delivering, creating presence. And, um, you know, early on, we needed to make some changes to, to how we facilitated. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're discovering the benefits of, I am at least as a leader, <laughs> discovering the benefits of having committees and, and uh, doing that kind of um, engagement as well. And as I said, the, the gaps with what's missing in terms of our processes and policies and the like that they are to put in place to allow um, to be for, for the kind of input that we need. So we're still really in progress and have made you know significant ones with, with uh, is, in institutionalizing uh, much of what we've gotten out of creating presence. I'm so glad to hear both of you talk about how this trauma-informed care stuff is not for the faint of heart because it, it can come across like, oh, I can take a three hour workshop and then and then and I'll be ready. Right. And it's way deeper than that, that the changes have to occur. So what actions were necessary in your organizations to actually really disrupt whatever embedded dynamics that were perpetuating problems in your organization, particularly around the imbalance of power? We. We had to take 
the, like I said, the scaffolding that was already in place around our lean daily management and give our voices power, a place, a setting, you know, to use that platform. There's these, um, what they call tiered huddles that go from, you know, the ground up to all the way up to leadership and encouraging our teams you know, as they're learning these concepts and, and things through presence and they're like, well, I don't, what do I say or where does this go? Take it to your huddle, take it there, speak up. You know, actually our engagement and enactment teams uh, ended up being supportive and, and encouragers for this voice carrying um, to be able to take the voices um, and make the actions take place it's still, we still have work ahead of us, right? I mean, it's still a work in progress. Um, but but we had to, speaking of connecting the dots, we, there was already so many great initiatives going on that we had already. So it takes work to say, well, you understand this, how this presence concept matches this, what we're doing, and we can do it even better, or this is, these are the extra pieces even more, right? Because some people would dismiss like, well, we already do that. You know, we already do that. Well, okay, but we can do it, you know, in these three ways more, right? That to really make it happen. Um, so that that's one thing that we really had to push Thanks. your voice. Thanks. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, first of all, I had to deal with my being willing to hear. Um, yes, yes, you did. <laughs> you know, I was part of, you know, the leadership team, uh, you know, the leadership group as we were going through this. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, there was the taking every, almost everything so personally, like it was an affront to my own leadership. And um, it's, this was, you know, this is part of the hard stuff. In a sense it is, mm -hmm. right? Because I am the leader of the organization. So, um having the courage to really confront that, to see that and go through whatever spaces I need to go through and um, to be able to hear what's really there. And then dealing with, um, you know, what do I put in place to mitigate my own blind spots? So doing things like having 360s now, which are developmental, we're developmentally focused for um, myself and the leadership team to make sure that uh, we're getting the kind of input that we need so that I can be cued in as well to where, you know, their developmental needs that folk have and they don't. One of the things that we haven't implemented yet is like a, a survey so that we can get more input. Um, but, um, you know, we have an HR person kind of consultant that we, we have, have in place that we now encourage staff, okay, we want you to kind of go to this external person. So, you know, there, there, there are those kinds of things that, you know, we've put in place and we continue to look, which I think is the most important thing. We are continuing to be engaged in the conversation and the looking and the awareness and the listening. What are some of the changes that you see after starting on this journey and, and being at this place in it? Hmm. Well, I'd quickly say one of the main things that I've seen is that our leadership has taken um, the implementation of presence and putting it on their strategic planning boards um, as a as a strategy and implementation going up. And and I know that other uh, WellSpan health leaders then see that right. Um, so that I was like, we're on the board. We're on, we're on it. We're on the strategy board. Uh, so that that was a huge win, and we're we're excited to keep doing our work and looking. I like that listening and looking, Carol, for sure. Yeah, oh, great. You know, I think staff are really grateful for the space that we've created to have these conversations, um, and for the very some of the very specific tools out of creating presence and the trainings that we've been able to do. Um, most organizations, there's not the space to have these kinds of conversations in community, really. And um, so I think that itself has really provided, it's also provided something for the folk who are uh, partic uh, participating as facilitators, because that's the shared leadership piece. And, and they have this opportunity to have this role where they're really uh, serving uh, peers, you know, um, in that sense. 
Um, so, uh, and I think that's that's been very edifying uh, for that team of folk who've been engaged. And uh, I, I, I've never been in an organization where we've had that um, kind of process. So, you know, we are, you know, in our 16 months, starting to become a new kind of organization. Were there specific light bulb moments for either of you two where you just like went, well, that's a shocking or surprising or makes me happy or it's terrifying? <laughs> I think right in the beginning, I had one of those moments after the first session, <laughs> Sarah, I thought, holy guacamole, <laughs> I need to make sure uh, my board is fully aware. <laughs> of all of this incredible work that we are doing, but somebody may be calling them soon yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, this is surfacing and appropriately surfacing, right? So I think to your point, this does require courage and um, those organizations aren't, you know, we, we're looking at ourselves and, and this is not a common conversation at all by any stretch, but I think an important and necessary one you know, for this world that we live in. So that my aha moment was like, wow, this really is new. And it's, it's appropriate for where we are with all of the trauma that exists currently in this world. We can't keep ignoring it, though it may be painful. We got it. We got to do something about it and be a different kind of organization to address it. Yeah, I would say the standout for me, the bulb went off um, when I saw comments on the discussion boards and feedback from new staff being onboarded, that they would say, I've never been part of an organization that paid attention to this mm -hmm. before. This is gonna be great, you know? And I thought, that really is different. Okay, like we're doing something right here. Um, so it was really great to see that. It, it was uh, motivating to keep going, keep going. <laughs> I've really, um felt so privileged um, to sort of have an insider's view to both of your organizations um, and and sort of watch that heavy lift. And um, also just want to express my gratitude to both of you for your leadership and bringing Sandy's and my work to life. Um, so thank you so much. We just heard from Carol Austin and Jennifer Laristis, who shared their experiences of using creating presence to integrate trauma-informed practice in their organizations. Join us next week to continue this exploration uh, when we meet with Dawn Isaac from a program that piloted created Pre Creating Presence, uh, Marymound in Winnipeg, Canada, and Robin Miller, the CEO of a program in Melbourne, Australia. And they're going to talk with us about reverence and restoration. You can reach us at creatingpresence.net or voiceamerica.com. See you next week. <laughs>